under the weather today, so if I pass out, we'll all just pretend I've been slain in the spirit, and you'll all go, hallelujah. That's why Danny Jones did communion this morning. I felt it would be wrong of me to taint the Lord's Supper with my infection, so we'll stay way back. You're in the splash zone up here, so that's unfortunate for you. So growing up, if there's one thing about marriage, hi, honey, that... (laughs) (laughs) movies and television and books taught me to fear. It was the concept of a mother-in-law. There is nothing that as a young man you get more terrified of than a future mother-in-law. I work weddings, and I can tell you, even though the mother of the bride won't be my mother-in-law, I give her a wide berth. I stay far away So imagine my surprise when my mother-in-law turned out to be the most perfect person ever to grace the earth since Jesus Christ. Rose over there is absolutely fantastic. I love my mother-in-law. Her and her husband live downstairs from Leanne and I, and so often I will be lying on the couch being completely useless. I'm on show number 30 of a marathon that will go all day, and Rose will just peek her head up the stairs and go, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. I just baked a whole bunch of cookies and I wondered if it wouldn't be too much to just give you a couple. (laughs) Yes, you can always just pop into my house and give me cookies. That's delightful. That's wonderful. Uh, Yeah, when I uh, was ready to have a mother-in-law, I was not ready to have one this good. And the other thing that Rose does around the house that is just phenomenal is she does all the gardening, which is excellent because And cut off. I don't have a green thumb. I don't even have a green toe. If you put a plant in my care, I'm going to just chop it up and eat it. That's about my extent of business with plants. But Rose has turned our garden into the Garden of Eden. It is phenomenal. The care that she puts into every one of those plants. She is up at early hours of the morning gardening with our cat, who is a faithful helper to her in the garden. <laughs> uh, this morning, I wanted to talk about gardening, or at least I wanted to talk about cultivating, because cultivating is a very specific word that I chose, not growing, but cultivating, because if I've learned anything from plants, it's that we don't actually grow plants. I don't grow a plant. The plant grows all on its own. My job, or Rose's job more specifically, is to create an environment in which the plant can grow to its fullest potential. That's cultivating. It's got all the business done for itself. It can grow. If you threw it out in the wild, the plant could grow. But what we do as gardeners, as cultivators, is to give it an environment where it can grow and where it can maximize every ounce of soil and fruit and water that we give it so that it can be the best plant that it can be. And so this morning I wanted to talk about cultivating the presence of God. Like plants, we do not actually grow the presence of God in our lives. He grows his presence in our lives, and thank goodness for that. (laughs) He would love to see his influence in our lives develop from a seedling into a mighty tree and every day to grow stronger and more fruitful. And our job is not to provide that growth. Our job is to create an environment where his presence can be more influential in our lives, where it can grow into that tree, because God is a gentleman. He does not go where he's not invited. We have to create space for him to move. I chose the word cultivating for a purpose, because unlike just the concept of growing, which is random and happens everywhere, even by accident, cultivating is purposeful. You can't cultivate something by accident. You have to go out like Rose every morning, and you have to water, you have to feed, you have to weed, you have to prune. It's a tough job. I'm glad that someone else is doing it around my yard for me. But when it comes to doing it spiritually, each and every one of us is responsible to take it on for ourselves. So I have learned some things about plants, and I've learned what they need to grow properly, and we're going to explore that this morning. So the first thing, if anyone could guess what does a plant need to grow, you'd probably say water. That's That's the obvious one. She didn't look at the notes. That's just good paying attention. Uh, Yeah, water. The first thing that we need to do when we're tending this garden is we need to water the plants. 
The quickest way to kill a plant, other than putting it in my care, is to not water it. It will dry up. It will die. A lack of water kills plants so quickly. The analogy here for water, I was thinking about it. What is water to a plant? Water is freshness. Water is life. Water not only cleans and feeds the plant, but it also cleans and softens the soil that the plant is growing in. And so it seemed pretty obvious to me that when it comes to watering the presence of God in our life, what we need to be watering it with is prayer. Prayer is the water that we pour on our lives to enable the presence of God to grow. Prayer, like water, it softens the soil of our hearts. Prayer, like water, it brings freshness. Prayer, like water, it cleans, it cleanses. And just like water, if we go without it for a very long period of time, eventually we will kill anything we were trying to grow. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 27. And we're going to read Psalm 27, verse 4. I was looking through the Psalms, which a lot of them are prayers, so it works out. And I was looking for an example of a prayer that I think exemplifies the idea of praying to cultivate God's presence in our lives. So Psalm 27, verse 4, I'm reading out of the NIV, and it says this. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I'm going to read that one more time. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. We can pray to God about praying to God. It's kind of a weird circle, but God wants us not just to pray and say, like, these are my problems, here's a laundry list of things to fix, but to pray and say, God, my desire is just to have you more in my life. He loves that prayer. He loves to hear that prayer. Not every prayer has to be a request. Sometimes it can just be us talking to God and saying, hey, I love you. I appreciate what you're doing in my life. Thank you for blessing me, God. I praise you. I worship you. That's an excellent prayer. Like watering a plant, praying works best when done scheduled, when done at very specific times. Now, obviously, I'm not going to say go out and you have to pray at 9 a.m. every morning or you've failed. But I will say that if our prayer life is scattered and random, it's not as effective as it could be. Let's make a habit of praying. What would happen if we started to all pray very specifically at very specific points in our day, not just when things come up, not just when we're in reaction or crisis, but to create a habit of constantly going back to the source, watering the garden, Praying when there's dryness, but also praying when there's not dryness. Praying when the soil is soft, but also praying when the soil is baked and cracked. The soil of our hearts can very easily become baked and cracked in the heat. Am I right? I know I've felt that when it feels like you can pour as much water, as much prayer on it as you want, and it just soaks it all up and gives nothing back. The answer is not to stop praying. The answer is to pray more. (laughs) And just like watering... There are times when the schedule won't be enough and we have to go above and beyond, but if we have that firm foundation, the habit of always, always being in prayer, as the Bible says, praying continually, oh, what a help that is when those times of trouble do come, that we already have that firm foundation, that we already were paying attention to God's presence in our lives on a regular basis. You can overwater a plant. You can't overpray. Just so that that's where the metaphor stops. I just wanted to be very clear about that in case somebody was wondering. Uh, I recently went to Lynn Canyon. If you haven't been to Lynn Canyon, it's absolutely gorgeous. And I don't know why you'd pay for the Capilano suspension bridge because the Lynn Canyon suspension bridge is free. So that's a pro tip. But I like to hike down into the canyon. And even in the midst of summer, when it's cooking hot, that canyon, because of the constant mist coming up from the waterfalls and the, the fact that the sun doesn't quite always get into it, it's always cool, and there is plant life growing on every surface. Because where water is, growth happens. Where prayer is, growth happens. But we have to be constant and vigilant in our prayer. We have to make sure that it's uh, 
being applied to the right places, that it's not just out of a ritual, but that we recognize that prayer is an experience that we get to have, that it's a relationship that we get to have. Um, The second thing that we do for plants after prayer is pruning and weeding. Pruning and weeding. Turn with me in your Bibles to John 15, because you can't talk about pruning without reading John 15. So we're going to do that. Uh, And we're just going to read verses 1 to 4. This is Jesus speaking. So John 15, verse 1 to verse 4, it says this, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, I know that this is not talking about God's presence growing in us. It's talking about us growing in God's presence. Kind of flipped it. But the principle is still the same. And the part that jumps out to me is where it says, he cuts off Every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Pruning is taking that which is fruitful and making it more fruitful. So we've done the watering. Now we're looking at the plant. We have to start identifying what is it that is bearing fruit and how do we increase that fruit. Let's not be content with small potatoes. Let's grow big potatoes. (laughs) that's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, and kill the weeds. The potatoes do kill the weeds. Don't, uh, it's not as easy as it sounds to, to identify those things. And just, oh, this is how I'm going to change it. The identification process is the hardest part because not all of us are very good at seeing the fruit in our lives. This is where a friend can come in very helpful, especially a friend that's not afraid to hurt your feelings <laughs> and will just say exactly what you need to hear. But saying to, to someone that you trust, hey, what are, what are the areas in my life that you see as fruitful? And saying to yourself in prayer, what are the areas in my life that I see that are fruitful? Maybe, as an example, it's serving. Maybe you are one of those wonderful, wonderful, blessed people that serves in children's ministries, that has a mansion waiting for them in heaven greater than any of ours. And you're finding that, hey, I'm serving in kids' ministries, and it is very fruitful spiritually to me. It's very fruitful in my present or in my walk with God that when I serve, I feel very full. And when I interact with the kids and, and see their smiles, it really fills me up, and it makes me feel closer to them, but also closer to the Father. What an excellent experience. Don't just stop there. If that's an area that's fruitful, how can you improve it? Maybe pray before every service experience. Maybe read something that will make it more fruitful. Maybe talk to someone else, get them involved. Maybe it's worship that's very fruitful for you. Maybe going into times of worship through music is so fruitful. Every time you do it, it's just such an amazing experience. And out of all the parts of Christian life, that's the part that really just brings home the bacon. And don't just settle for yesterday. Make it more fruitful. Prune it. Choose to make it the most fruitful part of your day in your walk with God. Choose to make it more fruitful in that it brings you closer to the Lord. Try new things. Try new experiences. Don't just stop and say, well, it grew one apple. That's enough for me. Let's all invest in those things that draw us closer to God so that we can go even deeper into his presence and into relationship with him. Now, pruning is one thing. Weeding is an entirely different thing. Um, If you thought that you'd be hearing a sermon about weed, you probably knew that it was coming sometime this year. But this is not that sermon. (laughs) Um, Weeds are obviously very bad. Weeds are the things that grow in the garden that you don't want. They're the things that are sucking up all the resources from the plants that you do want to grow. And sometimes weeds are very pretty. Sometimes weeds are actually quite gorgeous, and I choose to just call them not weeds anymore because I like them and I want to keep them around. But the truth is, when it comes to the question, what is a weed and what's not a weed, if it's not what you're trying to grow, it's got to go. Because even though it can look very pretty, even though it can spruce up the garden a little bit, it is leaching resources from that which you are trying to grow. 
I think the most obvious application here for us is sin. Those things, those distractions, those things that we shouldn't be participating in, those things that take us away from God, that leech the resources that we have for growing the presence of God in our life, but instead we're squandering them on weeds. And sometimes, like I said, they look good. Sometimes they, they don't feel like they're hurting the garden at all. They're just whatever. But if we let them grow, they will grow faster. They will become harder to take out. They will become more entrenched and enrooted in the garden. Weeding is a very painful process, unfortunately. Weeding means getting right down there in the dirt because if I've learned anything about weeds, you can't just snip the tops off and hope for the best. You have to get right in there, rip it out by the root. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you a story because my parents aren't here and they deserve this. And you're <laughs> don't tell them I told you this. This will be a test to see if they actually listen to the recorded version of the sermon. So we were doing the weeding in the front yard of our house. You know, like you do the spring cleaning every year. Anyway, it was late July and we were doing our spring cleaning. And there was all the weeds in the cracks of like where the curb and the driveway meet, you know, the spot that always grows like grasses and weird little plants. And so my jaw or my dad had drawn the job of weeding that section, but he was feeling very impatient with the whole thing that morning. And he was not about to go get down on his knees and weed every little piece of this cracked cement. So my dad, the firefighter got some gasoline from the garage and just poured just a little bit of gasoline all the way down the cracks in the driveway and the cracks. You can see where this is going already. It's phenomenal. All the way down. And then, with no water nearby, he lit it on fire. And sure enough, the weeds burnt up, as did the front hedge, <laughs> in a very dry July and so now dad is screaming, and mom is screaming, and the dog is barking, and he's yelling for water, and none of us know what's happening. There's a bunch of black smoke billowing up from the front of the house. And then he grabs the hose, and he tries to run with it, but it's in one of those, like, wheel hose things. So it won't come, so now the whole thing is, like, flying up in the air. Finally, he gets it on, and we're turning on the hose, and he's putting it out, and the neighbors are all like, what's happening? My dad's like, it's okay, I'm a firefighter. <laughs> anyway... All that to say, burn the weeds, <laughs> rip them out by the root, and burn them, not near a very flammable hedge. When we are dealing with sin in our lives, those things that are stealing the resources away from what we could be growing in God, we can't be gentle with ourselves and say, well, I'll just keep a little bit. I'll just snip it off here. I don't want to go any deeper. We have to do the hard work, digging down, ripping out the root, burning it all. Because it will come back. It'll come back and it'll come back more. <laughs> but if we're faithful to do the work, getting down in the dirt, really ripping out those things in our lives that are preventing us from experiencing the fullness of God's presence, he is so faithful to come back behind us and support us. Amen? And that's why we also, we pray first. See, the order matters. Water first, and then you do the weeding. Because otherwise, the ground is so baked and, and hard that it'll, be, it'll make this task so much harder. But we start with the watering. We start with the freshness of prayer. And by the way, spice up your prayer life. That's just, I'm just going to say, because I know so many other areas in our life, we're so careful to be like, yeah, make sure you just spice it up. You don't want to get too boring, like food or what, like movies or books. Like, if you met someone who just ate the same thing for dinner every single night, you'd think they are so weird. Like, just, they're so strange. Like, oh, an unseasoned chicken breast and steamed carrots again? You shouldn't have. <laughs> you really shouldn't. But <laughs> when it comes to prayer... We do that. We just we kind of get into this ritual where it's like we just pray the same thing with different words. It's all it's the same unseasoned chicken breast. Let's let's really get in there and and make our prayer lives exciting. We're getting to talk to the living God. That is exciting. That's that's enormously exciting. Don't just pray the same prayer over and over again. Pray in tongues. Pray in 
your mother tongue. Pray out of the Bible. Pray scripture over yourself. Pray with friends. Pray alone. Pray out loud. Pray quietly. Pray on your knees. Pray lying down. Pray with a dog. It's great. (laughs) Anyway, that's just an aside. Spice up your prayer life. If you really want to, like, if you're hearing this and you're thinking, like, oh, I've heard so many people talk about being better at prayer. Here's a very simple, practical how to be better at praying more frequently. It's post-it notes. Post-it notes are excellent. Just take a bunch of post-it notes, write the word pray on the post-it note, and put them in places where you'll see them through the day. Put one on like your lampshade beside your bed, one on your bathroom mirror, one on the dashboard of your car. And then what you do is, anytime you just glance and see that post-it note, no questions asked, whatever you're doing, you just pray. And it can be 10 seconds, it can be five minutes if you've got the time, but it's just about, you you see it and you go, okay, I saw it, I have to pray. And you don't get to say, well, I've already seen that post note today. You have to just pray whenever you see it. That's a great way to like just get prayer into your life because you kind of can't cheat. You see the post it note and you know because the post note's judging you. It's watching back. (laughs) Anyway, that was a total aside. (laughs) Uh, Weeding is the process of getting rid of those things that are not fruitful, that are sucking resources away from the fruit. If it's not what you want to grow, it's got to go. That's weeding. Pruning is taking the things that are fruitful and making them more fruitful. Now, there's another component to growing plants in the garden, one that I was unaware of for so much of my life. I actually thought it was a myth, and that is feeding the plant. I didn't know plants ate anything. I thought plant food was just a funny term for what vegans eat. I didn't know that there was actually something that you could... (laughs) Vegan food is actually very good, and I will not knock it. Uh, Plant food is real, it turns out. It it looks like little styrofoam pieces. You kind of put it in the garden. Anyway, plants eat. And like plants, we also eat. And yes, we eat food, but spiritually, we need to feed ourselves. And what we feed ourselves with is the Word of God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55, and we're going to read verse 10 and 11. Isaiah is one of the major prophets. How good for him. So he's after the Psalms and Proverbs section, but he's before all those little prophets whose names you don't remember. Um, Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11 says this, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word is like bread. Jesus says that when he's being tempted in the desert and the, and the devil says, hey, you haven't eaten in 40 days. Would you like bread? And Jesus says, no, I'm gluten intolerant. No, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We need to feed ourselves with the word of God. It's a very tedious business sometimes. I have read Lamentations, I know. But it's a very worthwhile business business. If we don't feed the plant, it'll probably grow, but it will never grow to the fullness that it could have if we actually spent the time to give it more nutrients and the feeding that it needs. And also, you don't feed a plant a steak dinner. (laughs) That sounds very obvious. You feed the plant what the plant needs. You don't feed God's presence in your life with fancy dinners and nights out and you don't feed God's presence in your life with movies and video games. You feed God's presence in your life with God's word. That is the food that his presence needs to thrive in our lives. And if we are feeding his presence with anything else, even religious experiences and, you know, all the fun of worship through music, it's all great. But if you're not feeding what it needs, the word of God, you won't see the fruit that you could have seen. Another story from my childhood, because I like to rat on myself. Um, when we were driving along as, when I was a kid, we were passing some fields, and they stunk because they had just been fertilized. And I said to my parents, what's that smell? And my dad said, that's manure. And I said, what's manure? And he said, it's poop. And then later, we were at a park, and the dog decided to do his business. And I said, dad, you have to pick up the dog newer. And he was like, the what? 
And I said, the dog newer. And he's like, well, what's that? And I said, well, if poop is man newer, then this is dog newer, and then there's cow newer, and all sorts of newers. <laughs> I don't know why anyone thought I was bright as a kid. I just, that's a dim bulb if ever I've heard it. But feeding the plant is important. Feeding God's presence in our life with God's word. We are so fortunate that he gave us his word. And I think so often we take it for granted. And we hope that when the time comes, we'll know how to say John 3.16. But there's so much more in there. It's so rich. It really is spiritual food. The Bible talks about spiritual food a lot. It talks about how when we're new to uh, spiritual things, we crave spiritual milk like a baby. But that hopefully one day we'll get off the milk and into the deeper, more exciting foods of life. That we'll be able to eat uh, more fully and be done with just the milk of childhood. When we, pr- or when, we read the presence, eh? when we read the word of God, that's what we're doing. We're growing up. We're maturing. And we're making room for his presence to grow deeper in our lives. How are we supposed to know what he wants from us if we will not listen to him and will not read his word? It's fruitless. So, we water, we prune and we weed, we feed, and then we water again. Because you have to water after you've done all this work, and you water before all you've done of this work. And the water and the feeding, by the way, create a really cool reaction. Because when we water first, then the soil is ready to receive the plant food. And then when we water after the plant food, the water enacts the food and and allows it to enrich the soil. And the same way, when we pray and we read the word, it creates a cycle. When we pray, we get more out of the word, and then we read the word, and we pray some more, and then we get more out of what we read. And it's a cycle of preparation and learning. If you're not accompanying your Bible reading with prayer, then you're missing out. You're, you're cheating yourself on half of the fun. So make sure water, prune and weed, feed, water again. And this is not a monthly